Before the video begins, please hit the subscribe button below. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome fellow business brokers. Thanks for joining us again today. Look, we get into a situation when something goes bad with a buyer and a seller and a deal, sometimes it turns into a lawsuit. And as business brokers, we can get swept up into that situation. So today, we are gonna talk about ways to stay out of those legal lawsuits and how to protect ourselves. And we got two great attorneys with us today. I've used both of these attorneys a lot. I'm really glad they joined us. Deborah, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Jim. Thank you for having me on. Oh, well, thank you for being here. Hey, Ken, how are you doing? I'm also doing great and appreciate you having me on today as well. Great. Hey, guys, both of you guys, uh, seriously, I work with both of you guys all the time. You guys are fantastic attorneys. I have a lot of respect for you. Also got Michael Johnson with us from AOR Insurance, and he's actually my insurance provider. He gives us EO insurance, liability insurance, and I don't know the name of it, but like extra auto insurance, which we'll be talking about later. How are you doing today, Michael? Doing awesome. Thanks for having me. Look forward to the discussion. Excellent. Excellent. Deborah, let's just jump right into this. Uh, so what are the things that you see happen from business brokers that kind of make your stomach turn and you, you think, okay, this could cause a, a, a legal problem for that business broker? What do you see? The worst thing I see, Jim, is when people try to practice law. I don't know if Ken agrees with me, but sometimes when I see okay. some of the addendums that come out and I see some of the things that they write, I get very concerned because they really are practicing law. The reason why they have the pre-printed contracts really is so that they don't have to get into trouble. And that's where people get into trouble because they don't understand some of the nuances, some of the things you're supposed to say. They get involved with that and that becomes a, a really big issue for both the agent and their broker. Great. And so and, you think the, and, the addendums, you see that a lot of, huh? Yeah, that's, a, that's an issue over here. People talking, you know, that, that should not be writing emails that, that they write. They have to keep really good control control of the emails and they have to make sure they keep copies and hard copies of everything. Some of the things that come across in an email are going to be problematic because I've seen people actually put forth that they're doing the own financial due diligence for the buyer, which is mm. kind of the craziest thing you can see because when the agent gets involved, the broker gets involved doing financial due diligence for him, no CPA is there, no other party is there, becomes very problematic for them down the line. Um, and also, if you're going to give an opinion, don't. Okay. <laughs> Stay away from that. You want to pass on information you've received from a buyer, from a seller, that's fine. You could be a conduit, but don't give your opinion because that gets you in more trouble than anything else because people rely upon that. And the first thing they think about is, well, the broker told me X. Right. Okay. So you want to just be very careful and especially don't put those opinions in, uh, in emails because people do that on a regular basis. Um, as well as the fact that people have conflicting agreements. I don't know if Ken's seen that. I certainly have where marketing agreement says A, but they put little handwritten notes in and the handwritten little notes don't really correspond to what was in the actual main agreement. There's conflicts that come back and forth. And of course, then it's an issue for the broker because what really happened over there, there was really no meeting of the minds and they could lose their commission, which is not something anyone wants to work that difficult, you know, work that hard for and then lose the commission. Um, and the same thing is, you know, when deals end post-closing, you don't want to sit there and give information to attorneys who are fishing to see who they can sue. Mm. And you don't want to also provide them with, uh, with any documents, particularly private documents that you have. So the, the easiest way to sum it all up then is really be more of a conduit, but be, you know, something and be involved with a buyer and seller, but be more of a conduit than giving opinions and doing the work for them. So if an attorney is asking for your information post-closing, you know, you should uh, either talk to your attorney or you should wait to be subpoenaed with, for that information. Is that correct? Exactly. Exactly, okay. Jim. Because, um, you know, Ken's going to not agree with me 100% potentially, but attorneys are not necessarily your friend. <laughs> <laughs> you guys I would agree with that. I, I think it's important. Like transactional I agree. I agree with that. Okay. <laughs> transactional attorneys are your friend. Okay. Yeah. The litigation attorneys are not necessarily your friend. Okay. Um, so, you know, if they're representing the buyer and the seller, but transactional attorneys, yes, we're looking out to see what we can do to help everybody as well. Because right. we don't want to have any problems. Um, so I mentioned marketing agreements. NDAs are a problem too. You want to make sure you have a proper NDA because if you don't have that, that's going to leave you in a potential lawsuit as well because you just gave information out without protecting anyone. What do you mean a proper NDA? What do you mean? Just that you're using the, it's filled out properly right. and right. signed and. Properly the proper parties. I mean, you can't just go count, give confidential information to everybody out there. And I've seen people do it. 
they'll put someone on there and all of a sudden 10 other people identify themselves, oh, I'm a relation, I'm a friend, I'm the ex-wife, whatever it is, all of a sudden everybody's got everything. And all well, that's, that gets me concerned too, is like somebody calls up a brokerage house and they say, I'm interested in such and such business you have for sale. And they say, okay, what's your name? Uh, John Smith, what's your address? Boom. And you send them the NDA and then they sign it and they send it back. How do you know that's John Smith? They could not be telling you the truth. Like you need to, you need to do that. The driver's license, you get all the information from them. And what I've seen too, with it's carelessness, people don't have the right company down. Okay. And people don't know what the company owns. We'll mm. wind up with assets and it winds up being a major headache because, you know, another company owned those assets. This company is known as a lease. So I've got, and I have another two companies owning another, another company that's a distributor. So if you don't know what you're doing 100% when you take the listing and you don't have all the proper parties in there, it becomes an issue. It becomes an issue too. I'm sure Ken sees a lot too because you have to do a non-compete. Well, who is going to be on the, on the competitive end in the sense of, is it going to be a spouse? Is it going to be a child? You know, who's running that other company that we don't know about at the time we take the listing? Wow. Deborah, you gave us like a ton of information very, very quickly. I really appreciate that. I'm sure you even have more and we're going to come back to you. But let's, let's switch over to Ken real quick. Are, are there things that Deborah has not said yet that you see are the biggest issues with business brokers when it comes to legal issues in a, in a transaction? Well, I, I certainly agree with Deborah. I think the uh, broker needs to make sure they're staying in their own lane. They're, they're taking care of what they need to take care of. I think it's really important that the broker talk to uh, really the seller, if they're uh, starting out with a seller, really understand their business, really understand what's going on with it, and understand what they should be presenting and try to get from the seller all of the information that the seller is telling them, maybe verbally, they get that in writing, that they have something that shows where they're getting the information from that they're presenting. So the broker knows that they're on solid ground for what they're presenting. They're not just um, relying solely on what the seller is telling them, but they're also doing at least a little bit of uh, due diligence on their own to make sure that they're getting the right information out. And I think that's really important. And on the same thing on the buyer, uh, you wanna make sure as a broker that the buyer that's coming in uh, is giving you accurate, accurate information, is not wasting your time, uh, and is a legitimate potential buyer for the business you're selling. All right, great, great. Hey guys, just so you know, we are gonna slow down in a minute. Oh, sorry, Michael, did you wanna say something? Well, I'll just suggest one thing. They, they both nailed the head on. Um, most of our disputes and claims on e &O insurance are performance related to opinions of how the broker thought the business was gonna run after the transaction. Mm -hmm. I would say, 60, 70% of the claims we get to defend are related to the business broker putting things in email and sharing opinions about the performance of the business. So right. you, you, Deborah and Ken, you guys hit it on the head. Holy cow, 60 to 70% of Absolutely. the cases that you see are, are business brokers giving opinions that they shouldn't be giving? You know, Absolutely. I think it all comes down to business brokers got it. And I, I can't believe people don't know this, but, and I shouldn't say it that way. That's, that's horrible. But, you know, as business brokers, we are not attorneys. We can't give legal advice. We're not, we're not accountants or CPAs. We can't give financial advice. You know, that's the biggest thing is don't give financial advice. Don't give legal advice. At the end of the day, we're taking the information the seller is giving us and we're giving it to the buyer. And we're yeah, taking the we're information the buyer is giving us and we're giving it to the seller. We're brokering a deal. We're, we, we're, I think I see brokers try to get into a transaction and they try to elevate themselves and try to put them in a position where they're, they're, they're giving advice and they're consulting and that type of stuff in a transaction and we shouldn't be doing it. I mean, we should be consulting on how the transaction should be taking place, but we shouldn't be doing business consulting, you know, during a transaction. We could, we shouldn't be given financial advice. We shouldn't be given legal advice. And I want to touch on real quick. You were talking about these addendums. I want to back up real quick, Deborah. You were talking about these addendums that, that business brokers write up these addendums. The business brokers of Florida right now is um, thinking about having an attorney write up a set of addendums because we use the same things over and over again. Once a deal goes under contract, the business needs, you know, the, the closing needs to be extended. It's a great idea. Um, you know, that type of stuff. And instead of us doing it, having an attorney doing it, and then we can just plop it in. Is that, does that sound reasonable? So, Jim, I've been, uh, I do real estate as well. And I've been doing that for the same 38 years and all the forms are there. Yeah. All the forms are there for, uh, for all the agents that come on board. They just have to fill out a form, pull it out, and be done. And that is the easiest way. And I see that for the business brokers. 
And I know the frustration that business brokers feel because they're entrepreneurs themselves. They've had their own businesses. They know what they want to write. They know what they want to say. But you know, step away from that and just say, listen, it's black and white. I'm just going to do something really over here that I need to do, protect myself, protect right. my clients, and we're done, um, as opposed to being super creative. You want to be super creative, get Ken involved, get me involved, <laughs> then we're creative, okay? Because that's what we do for a living. It's not just, I haven't seen a real vanilla deal yet. Have you, Ken? No, not too many of them. But I also would suggest that, you know, if the broker gets into a situation where they need to have an addendum with any kind of uh, complexity mm -hmm. to it or creativity, yeah. yeah, and they don't want to go to an attorney for some reason, which Deborah and I would say is wrong, but whatever it is, they should go to the parties. If the buyer and the seller are telling you a certain thing that they want in an addendum, let them write it. Let them email the language to the broker. The broker drops it into the addendum and sends it back to them to sign. So that's a way to protect and, and yourself. I agree with what Ken says, but I go one further. I go one step further. Um, I know we have waivers for attorneys. I know we have waivers for accountants. And, and, and I'm going to ask you, Michael, what you see over here for the E&O problems. When you don't have an accountant involved and you don't have an attorney involved for the parties, okay, that leads to more problems, I believe, for a broker than anything else because you need a team of people that compliment you. You don't want to be there alone. Absolutely. You need good yeah. you need good attorneys though. You need attorneys that and CPAs that know what they're doing in a, right. in a in a transaction, not your typical general business attorney or general attorney. You need attorneys that specialize in what you guys specialize in because if not, it's just making our job more difficult. So no, no, no. I agree our, yeah. with you, but I've seen people try to discourage, and I've seen some of the brokers discourage having an attorney, discourage having an accountant. And that to me leads to, to the problems because you want, you want someone there to compliment you and be part of the team. You don't want to have to, like I said, go it alone and then wind up having problems later. And, and I always say too, that when you're finished with due diligence, get them to sign off on it. Yeah. I think that is so unethical. I think it's unethical. And I think that I, I'm not an attorney. Maybe you guys can tell me, I think that you could be in legal problems as a business broker by telling, telling a seller or a buyer that they, if oh, they definitely. say, oh, maybe should I take my attorney? You say, no, you don't need to go to your attorney. You can get in trouble for that, right? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely, definitely you can get in trouble for that. But I mean, even the ones that don't know, the worst people, and I, I'm going to ask Michael again, the worst people are the ones that don't know what they're doing. They're mm -hmm. just dangerous enough client-wise that don't know what they're doing and that they're not guided, okay? That becomes an issue later on down the road. And, yeah. But that's, I think I want to get this point across on this though. I, 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 when somebody says you go to talk, should I take this to an attorney? Should I have my attorney? Absolutely. You should, should have an attorney review it. Do you have an attorney? And they say, yes. Well, do they you make sure they specialize in this? And if they don't, right. I can send you names of two or three attorneys to talk to because, and then I go on and explain why it's so important. They talk to an attorney that really knows what they're doing because getting the wrong attorney involved, I want the attorney to protect my buyer or seller but I don't want to get an attorney involved that has no idea what they're doing. Deborah, we had this situation yeah. last year. We don't want to yeah. mention the transaction, yeah. but we had an attorney involved in a situation that they had no idea what they were doing and it almost killed the deal. And, no, so and, the wrong attorney is going to kill the deal. Um, just for example, yesterday I wrote up a fairly simple contract for a fairly simple business and I got, I got a 97 page addendum. Hmm. Mm. That wasn't so, for me, just FYI. Yeah. <laughs> so, Ken, Deborah, you guys think that's that's a good situation, though? Because, I, like, I look at it as far as the addendums. Us business brokers, we use the same addendums over and over again. There's probably a half a dozen that we use. I think it's a great idea, Jim. I think it's and, perfect because it should be. And again, it goes back to practicing law, which should make every broker, you know, scratch their head. And, and actually, you know, I know it makes all the brokers very nervous when their agents do that because you don't want anybody practicing law. Number one, it's a felony, and number two. That's what causes the problems to either die or causes the problems at the end where you're sued because nobody got involved with an attorney uh, that knew what they were doing or an attorney period and the deals then became problematic. Guy, I, I, I agree and I'm going to tell everybody that's listening right now is not just because Deborah and Ken are attorneys, they're saying to use right. attorneys. They see things firsthand and I'm sure Michael can attest to this too, how important it is to have attorneys involved keep the legal issues with the attorney so that we don't get hit as right. business brokers. Right. I want to that, touch that, on something that, that, that to me is the most important thing. I want to, I want to touch on something that Ken was talking about. Ken was talking about emails and, and, and emails can be your best friend and they can be your worst enemy. To me, an email is, uh, you know, I, I, I get a, a, a weird feeling in my stomach about a situation. I'm like, Oh my God, if I told the buyer this, if I tell the buyer this, this deal is going to die. 
And, and when I think that, I'm like, yeah, I need to tell the buyer this. So I call up the buyer and I tell them the buyer this, but then I want to follow up by email so that they later on can't say, you didn't tell me that. So emails are like your best friend or your worst enemy. Yeah, and I, I think it's really important, Jim, when you're, when you're doing an email, you got to think of two, two situations where this email is going to be. And that one is in front of your high school English teacher. So you need to, you know, you want to make sure you're doing I a good job there. of typing it out. And, and it's not just a quick answer. Um, it actually explains itself and makes sense. Uh, but you also want to think about it blown up in front of a jury of your peers right. who are making a judgment as to whether or not you screwed up. And yeah. so if you can think about that every single email, which is difficult, you have to stop after you write your email, read it again, make sure it makes sense before you send it. And that's really going to help agree a lot with Ken. And, and, you know, I understand what you're saying, Jim, you want a confirmation of what just occurred and you want them to confirm that employee is leaving and they're replacing him with Joe Smith. You know, you want to confirm that they understand that there's, yeah. uh, there's an issue uh, with, could be a financial issue, whatever it's going to be and, and confirm their answer to it. So yes, I agree with that. And I agree to, you know, what Ken's saying too about how you write it because I've seen angry emails coming from brokers. And to me, that gets people in the worst situation if you write in anger. So if you're angry, write it out. Don't send it to anybody and rewrite it. Yeah, that's good. That's a good point. I, I, I want to go one step further too. Like we hear about politicians that write a really you know, bad email and it gets picked up and it's like, holy cow, I can't believe that person wrote that or what, what were they thinking or they admitted to something or blah, blah, blah. You know, I, it's not like they, they're thinking about it. You know, let's take us. If we write as a business broker 50 emails a day, which I don't know if that's that far out of the question, and you do that over a course of a year, you're looking at over 10,000 emails that you're writing in a year. And, you know, a lot of them are just one sentence or a few words or something. But, you know, we don't pay attention to our emails because we do it so much and so often. And sometimes as business brokers, we've got to step back and say, hey, every email that we're writing, that one email that it can be misinterpreted because we didn't, we didn't put enough thought into it. We just wrote right. it really quick and we sent it right. and we didn't mean for it to say what it said. That might be the one that comes back and bites us in the butt, right? No, you're absolutely right. And I would say too, I see people getting texts all the time. Please don't do it by texting. Please do it by email. Oh, wow. Yeah, I would Texas strongly agree with that. It's difficult to get texts admitted. They, they're often easy to take out of context mm -hmm. uh, and, and not great from a legal perspective. I did not know that. I did not know that. Hmm. Yeah, and I see 95% of what the business brokers are doing is by phone call or by text. Another thing Ken was talking about, he was, he was like, make sure that, you know, you're, you're getting verification from the seller on things. And like, you know, when you, when you write a CBR or you're writing your, you know, one page marketing sheet or anything you're writing, you're putting out there to potential buyers, you should always get that approved by a seller. I like, I, I email the seller and say, Hey, let me know if anything's wrong or I need to change anything. And I just wanted to touch on that. So no, you're um, absolutely right. And, and the same thing happens when, you know, I'm sure Ken does stock purchases like I do, and we need all the correct information to do that. And uh, we need the K1s, we need every, all the information. Is, you know, indubitably, somebody thinks about uh, someone they haven't seen in 20 years that owns 5% of the company. Hmm. <laughs> that somehow that didn't get in there. So um, you always have to be very careful what you gather in. And I think that's a good point, what you're saying. When you take the listing, take as much information in as possible so that you're aware of what's going on. And people have nicknames. I don't know if that's come up with you, Ken. Why well, not? It's, you know, someone's calling him Ernie, but it's Scott. And it's very, very confusing. And I have to say, all right, let me get to the parties over here. And then I find out, oh, no, no, really, Ernie wasn't Scott. Ernie was another relative, uh, <laughs> and he works there. So getting all the parties straight now, even when you take the listing, is very important. Yeah, I would, I would definitely second that. I think it's, I, I see a lot where people are putting in the name, you know, brokers are putting in the names of the seller. Right. Uh, and it isn't necessarily the name of the company that's selling the assets. It could be the, the DBA they're listing, which is okay, but it's very helpful to put the whole corporate name, DBA, and then the business name. And, the and that way, numbers. you know, when we're doing the documents, we're reviewing it, it helps a lot to really understand who is selling what. Right. And, and you know, if there's real estate attached, another problem I see, and I don't know if it comes up with Michael, if there's real estate attached, there needs to be a separate real estate contract. Yeah. Yeah. 
And we always see that it goes down there and they're right, well, at the very end, we'll do the contract, but then there's problems with that as well. So you want to try to get everything done as quickly as possible so you have them both at the same time. Or at least that's my feelings. It makes it easier. Mm -hmm. Now, what about this? If, if a, a, a business, a buyer that's buying a business and a seller selling a business, is there less liability on our part than if it was uh, two consumers buying and selling a house? I mean, is there a look, because are the business people considered to be, yes. have yes. more business acumen? Yes. Yeah. It, you know, it's considerably different than a consumer because a consumer, uh, you know, has a different level of protection. Um, buyer beware is there in a consumer situation. But at the same time, even though this is a business, I would almost treat it the exact same way. And that keeps you out of problems. Because if there's something that everyone is hiding, it will come out at some point in time. And that's what bites you. Okay. What I hear all the time when I'm talking to brokers too, is they refer to their buyer or seller as their client. Uh, right. Well, what's, right. can the you customer. guys talk about that? Yeah, I think that's, that's very, very important that brokers understand the distinction. If you're a transactional agent, they are not your client. You need to stay away from that. You are helping to facilitate the deal. But if you tie yourself to one party or the other, then you're opening yourself up to a potential suit by either the party who thinks you're their agent and, and is absolutely representing their interest only or primarily, uh, or the other side who thinks that you're supposed to be transactional, uh, but then sees you representing that seller or buyer directly. And that could very much cause a problem. No, exactly correct. And, and for the connotation, they are customers, they're not clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I, I agree, and I understand that, that customer versus client situation, but um, I hate, I don't want to call somebody a customer because that, I think, diminishes what we do. So I just call my buyer, my seller. Is that right, okay? Right, exactly. Exactly. Okay. And that, that's a good point. That's fine. Um, but, but people are really funny about that because they don't realize that under Florida, all the business brokers are still underneath uh, the real estate license. Yeah. So, that's so everything else, it's a big difference. It's a huge issue on the insurance policies too, because most business brokers will buy their E and O policy, but they have not um, they have not communicated the real estate side of their business. So the key to E and O insurance is the definition of the professional services. So if you get into a bunch of different professional services beyond just business brokering and you're involved in real estate has to be specifically defined in the policy. Your yeah, that's very services. important. Yeah. Very important. You know, we're salespeople. I mean, like, I mean, we're not, we are, and we're not, I mean, we could have that debate, but you know, we are selling businesses. Um, you know, if, if we're puffing up something or we're doing a little bit of an exaggeration, I'm sure that could be an issue too. Right. Uh, yes, they always say what there's two stories. <laughs> <laughs> but if I, but if you're just saying like I'm I'm talking to a buyer, I'm writing a buyer an email, and and the buyer says, hey, I'm interested in such and such business, and I email back and I say, hey, this is a great business, it's got fantastic financials. I mean, what what is is that bad, or is can that get me in trouble, or? I, I certainly wouldn't want to see that written that way. It's got fantastic <laughs> financials. You might see they have books and records, which you know, and it's not in a shoebox. But, yeah. you know, it's got tax returns, but certainly to come back and then make any kind of comments that are uh, in that tone, I think is going to come back potentially and haunt you because you don't want to be ever accused of making a recommendation or making anything in that direction. Go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry. Yeah, the Jim, the lawsuits we see on that is the failure of the business. So you, you, you talked about all this fantastic stuff that you sold me as you're, you were emotional about it and passionate. And I bought the business and then it failed. And everyone knows when things fail, just like with everything going on right now, the litigation rates are the highest, almost the highest in hit they've ever been in history right now. So um, wow, really? litiga litigation follows. So yeah, I, I would just make a distinction, Jim, because I know that brokers want to sell and you need to sell, that it's okay to say, based on what the seller has told me, I feel like this is a great business for you to consider based on what I've, I've seen. Better. And again, talking generally um, is less risk than talking more specifically. I've seen the financials and they are so clean. I've never had a business this clean before. That's trouble. That's not where you want to go. You want to stay more broad, more general, and that's the less risky way to do it. 
absolutely. You could say the financials look like they're really they're really good and really straight, but you'll have your opportunity to do due diligence to see if that's really the case or something like that, like kind of giving yourself an out, or is that even bad? That's better. You want to be really careful. Ken, I'm going to start sending you all my emails before I hit send. And, and, uh, and have you, <laughs> just, you know what really happens? What happens is you might be with a seller for two years before that business sells or a year and a half or whatever it might be. Talking, and you're really friendly with that seller by this point. And that comes across in how you talk to the buyer. And it comes across as far as how you almost recommend that seller when you talk to the buyer. And you got to be very careful with that. Because you're a transactional agent. Right. Okay. So let me give, this, give you guys this scenario. There, you, you, you can list a pet store for sale. And um, you find out that Petco is going to be opening up across the street in six months. You've got definitely disclosed that, right, to a buyer? That's a no-brainer, right? I would. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> but if you don't know, I mean, is there any liability if, we, if you, if you as a broker generally do not know that that's happening? I mean, there's no liability there, is there? I well, would if, if you read the lawsuit right now on that very thing. Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. They they lost 350 clients due to competition moving in right after the transaction, and it li literally crippled their business. So they they sued everyone, the right. franchise, the business broker, everyone was named in, uh, and it was settled. It was settled for $150,000. On the broker side or they're settled with the seller? So the business broker settled with the insurance, wow. using insurance for $150K. Wow. Then Deborah, was, Ken, is that, a, is, that, is, that a, like, is that something we would have to worry about? Like, if we really don't know that somebody's moving in, you know, I mean, you can well, sue for anything, but yeah, again, there, the, Was there public right? knowledge? Was there public knowledge in that sense? Yeah, the, yeah, there was public knowledge. It just, the, there wasn't like, you know, broker knowledge, you know, the broker didn't dig deep type scenario. And, but he was, he, he or she was overselling it again, overselling yeah. the deal with emotion and emails that back up that emotion can go sour on you. Cause there was a lot of emails used in the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that you could talk about, is fantastic. you talk about a duty to disclose, certainly, Jim, I think that's what you're talking about. Uh, if you don't know about something, it's impossible to disclose it. And, you know, the unfortunate thing with litigation is having insurance is so important and your insurance company looks at litigation differently than you do. Your insurance company says, what's the cost of defense? What's, you know, should we sell this for 150,000 um, because we see exposure or because of concerns, even though the broker did everything right? Absolutely. So it's not that you can't, you know, you're always going to get caught up in this. It just happens. So right. it happens, the, but I'm going to go one step further, Ken. Not to interrupt, go ahead. But I, I think if you are in the community, okay, and you're not over in another state trying to sell a business in a, in a different state, I think that could be an issue too. Um, if you're selling in Nevada and you don't know what's going on over there at that point in time, that could come up and bite you because you should have potentially had knowledge. Absolutely. Okay. If you're selling in Florida right here and you know what's going on and, uh, and you missed it, that could be an issue too, because remember you're coming in as a professional. So okay. if there's been uh, all kinds of uh, newsletters coming up, there's problems coming up, you know, you know, just based on living in the neighborhood or living close by or whatever, something's going to happen over here. You see groundbreaking. That's partially with you, okay, though I can't agree that's totally. But the second thing is what I find, and I don't know if Ken and Michael agree with me, is buyers do not do due diligence. And that comes back on everybody because if they would do due diligence on their own very well, they would find out a lot of these issues way beforehand. They're mm -hmm. waiting for you to do their due diligence. Oh, and, we got to make a very clear, no. I make it very them, clear. Like I'm not them, involved in that saying. due diligence at all. But I'm saying if some business brokers do, they get involved with the due diligence, the financial due diligence with the buyers. They tell them how to do it, what they right. need. Tell them and, how to yeah. do it, show them everything. And that's a problem because then you're taking on a burden that was not your responsibility and then you're caught up in it. You know, you're not a CPA. And then I always tell people, do not take jobs that you are either not qualified to do or licensed to do. 
because let that ask, also comes back and bites you. That, that's, that's great. Let me, let me give you guys another scenario. Let's say that you, you saw a business worker sells a business and, uh, you know, there's an owner note involved. And then post-closing, uh, it's found out that that, uh, that, that buyer is a, um, you know, has fraud cases against them and, you know, has some, you know, a shady background. Can the seller come back after you on that? Or what's the, what's the situation on that? See, I think it depends upon if you've given information and you say, I have, I have, you know, we've qualified the buyer. I don't know if that comes across with you ever, Ken, but some of my, some of the sellers say, oh, okay, well, the broker qualified the buyer. Why don't we have pre-qualified the buyer? Is that, is that better or does it still not you know, good? You, you, you know, if you should, if they're going to um, give a loan, you should not be involved as far as I'm concerned, their credit worthiness. Because once you open that door, you've opened that door then to everything that this buyer mm -hmm. can really do. So if you let them do their own diligence on the seller, the seller, I mean, excuse me, on the buyer, the buyer is going to get information about uh, IRS returns, you know, anything else, period. I think that takes a burden off of you than you giving all the information to them and saying, hey, you know, he looks pretty good to me. I wouldn't even, I, I think there's people listening right now that are probably saying, well, maybe I should, you know, run, run a report on them, you know, because there's reports you can run online. I wouldn't even do that because then, you, you know, you don't know, you might miss something, you know, You're and then you can be held in liable. Yeah. Position. yeah just, that you would normally be. just transfer it, it information really back, back and same, forth. Same idea that we were talking about before, you know, do you know, and do you disclose what you know, and what duty do you have to investigate? And I think that the more the broker sets themselves up to be an investigative person helping somebody, the more they're going to be expected to know and to disclose, whether it's for the buyer or the seller. Right. And so it's better to stay away from it if you can. If you do bring it in, I think it's important to rely on what's factual. You know, I'm sending you the P&L that the seller provided me, and this looks like good P&Ls based on what I can see just looking them over. That's not great, but it's not horrible. Or and this go buyer further, Ken, tell them at that point, go see your CPA. Right. You need to review these. You need to take them to your CPA and make sure that, that everything looks good, compare them to the tax returns, and make sure you're doing your due diligence. Those are the kind of things you want to tell them. And with the buyer, you also want to, you know, again, qualified, pre-qualified. What does that mean? What are you actually doing to make sure the buyer is pre-qualified? And what you're it's not doing. Very, what's that? Yeah. And tell them what you are doing and what you're not yeah, doing. You're putting yourself probably... in a, to me, you're putting yourself in a very dangerous situation by giving information out that it really you shouldn't be involved in. And well, you should I, figure it out but, themselves what they want to do. But yes, Ken, I mean, like Ken said, I could say, well, we pre-qualified the buyer. This is what we did to pre-qualify them. But that's all we've done. Is that okay to say? or? Yeah, you know? I think there's a risk. And what Deborah's saying is, is right, that there's always a risk. And in, in, the okay, farther yeah, down yeah. you go, the more risk you have. But I think in the reality of the sales of, that yeah. you're trying to do, the parties expect you to transfer some information. And so I think if you are transferring information with the understanding that this is what was given to me and I'm now giving it to you and that you, know, you need to investigate this further and make sure that it makes sense or that your accountant's happy with it or whatever it is and not jump in and give emotional uh, support where it's not needed. Right, right, exactly. Uh, I'm going to bring up a really touchy subject and uh, I'm probably going to have my fellow business brokers um, get upset with me about it, but they need to understand I'm doing this for our own good. What about businesses that um, they're not reporting all their income and uh, you know, they're not reporting they're, they're taking cash and they're not reporting on their tax return. They have um, it. <laughs> and we let's say let's say that you know we we, we advertise it with with the, with the cash that is um being uh reported that's not being reported oh jeez you're advertising with the with well if, if you're including that cash as a broker i think that's a problem i think you need to make sure that you are not assisting any seller in doing anything that violates the law and so if they're not reporting to the irs uh, their revenue as they should, uh, or profits or however it's, it works out, um, that's a problem. But if you do not know about it, if it's not in front of you, uh, and you are advertising this business based solely on what's on the P&L, what's on the tax returns, uh, I think there's a, a better case that you have nothing to do with whether or not they're hiding cash, and that makes it somewhat okay. 
And you know what really happens, which, which is so interesting to me, is people will take a sales tax return and report di different income than they report on the IRS return. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> they can't even keep the inconsistencies <laughs> with that part of it. But, but that's Deborah, a real what's, issue. What's your, what's your outlook? What's your, what's your view on that business, on the business broker that takes a, a, a business on for sale that, and, and is advertising the cash that's not being reported? Is, well, first of do, all, do, I would never advertise that cash is not being reported because then the IRS has a problem with you. It's, Okay. Yeah, no, okay. It's not gonna cover that. <laughs> you know, this, you this, have knowledge then that they're not paying their taxes. So first of all, you're never going to put that in a listing, right? You're yeah, never going to report that it's it's uh, you know you can put unreported you know not even unreported you can put miscellaneous income or something. Right, like that. right, but, right, right. But I'm saying like you're you're. Cash. you're it's right. <laughs> right. No, I'm saying I'm saying like the business is doing four hundred and fifty thousand right. um, dollars on tax returns, but they're really doing five fifty because they're pocketing, you know, they're they're not reporting a hundred grand and you put it out there and you're saying the revenue on this business is five fifty. Is there fallback on the business broker for that? I, I think what you're doing is uh, you're gonna have to let your buyer decide what they want to do. And let's not be unrealistic. And Ken and I can sit there and say all day long, no, 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 don't do this. But we all know what happens in the state of Florida. We all know what goes on over here. Um, and the bottom line is you can't represent to the buyer there's additional income. All you can represent to a buyer is what's transferred to you, as far as I'm concerned, what's on a return. And as far as what, what you can see in black and white. But if they want to do observational due diligence and they see that there are so many people coming into this place of business and it looks terrific, and they want to sit there for five days or they want to go on, on a route with them, but whatever they want to do, that's up to a buyer. Yeah. Like if, if you point out over here, there's a cash component, you know, to me, you know, I, I know it goes on, but to me, it's, it's, it's a hard thing for you to have to do that. And, and, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to go on this too much because we got a lot to go over and I want to get all the information across, but I think this is a really important situation because, you know, let's face it, most small business owners, most small business owners, that are dealing in cash are not reporting all the cash. I mean, that's right. just a fact of life. Right. I, I, I don't think that's a surprise to the IRS. I mean, that is just a fact of life. Um, you know, my, my thing is I, I do not take on owner approves anymore, but what I've always been told with the owner approved situation, and, and I've had brokers, older brokers uh, tell me this, I've done research online, which that doesn't mean crap. And I once had an IRS agent tell me that that was true, was that, we can't get in trouble in the United States for knowing somebody's not reporting things on their tax return. We, if they're creating tax fraud, we can't get in trouble for that. We're not required to turn them in uh, as, a U, as a fellow U.S. citizen. You can't get in trouble if you're a tax preparer or the one that prepared the taxes on behalf of that person. Um, but, uh, you know, and we can't recommend to a buyer, well, you should do the same thing the seller is doing. You know, we can't do that. But just knowing, hey, that business is doing 550 in gross sales versus 450, you know, it, 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 as long as the seller is telling us that, the buyer is going to do their due diligence and the buyer and the seller are going to go behind closed doors and do it. I mean, you know, what I, mean, do, I don't personally want to do owner to proof, but I just want to see what you guys think from a legal standpoint. I'll give you the easiest way to do it. Go to the CPA yes. because they know all the back doors, okay? The CPA knows how much water was used at the laundromat. The CPA has all of these different ways to back in to the figures and let them do it and let them get, you know, uh, into that with a buyer for due diligence as opposed to you trying to point that out to them. But they all have ways to do it. You go to a hairdresser, they go through the appointment book. I mean, everybody has their ways to backtrack and to find, you know, to find the income and see what's there. And that's what, to me, the CPA does. So when you have a professional lined up with you, you're set. Jim, if, if you're willfully hiding income on a deal, the policy probably is not going to defend you. Right. Good. That's nice to know. Yeah, right. Okay. But if you gave that them to a CPA you know about it. and the CPA says, hey, you know, um, I'm finding this amount over here, but I can't find this amount, and they make a report, that's nothing to do with you. You're out. And that's why I'm saying to you, don't anything that's in your job and your purview do anything you can give to someone else to do for liability purposes. Dead on. Them. Yep. Dead on. 100%. Yep. Yep. And CPA is not going to do that. You know, they're not, they're not going to, you can't talk to a CPA about that cash, but you know, this is my thing about the owner to prove is, you know, 20 years ago, let's take a restaurant, for example, 20 years ago, 
restaurants, you know, 80% or 50% was credit card, debit card, 50% was cash. Nowadays, you know, it's 80% debit card, credit card, 20% cash. And, and, you know, as a business broker, you just kind of ignore, I ignore the cash at this point because you're getting that 80%. And if you're selling that business and you're saying that business is doing $150,000 on tax returns and uh, versus, you know, $200,000 off tax returns, and it's the same sales price, just the fact that you're saying they got that off of tax returns versus, you know, this cash being taken, you're more likely to sell it for that $150,000 bottom line. So I've just found there's better just to ignore it. And if you can't ignore it because and it, it doesn't justify the selling price, selling price, don't take it as a listing. But right. I at least wanted to get your guys' thoughts on that. I agree with you. And if you feel uncomfortable taking a listing, okay, you all have a good sixth sense by now. Step away. No one needs the money that badly to cause yourself a lawsuit or a problem. Step away. Great. All right. That's good advice. So what's the statute of limitations if, if we close on a deal? You know, how many years need to go by before the, 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 a seller or buyer can't sue us? Is there a statute of limitations? Depends on what the claim is. So you're looking at uh, four years or five years under contract, or it could be longer with fraud. It just depends. Okay. Uh, Ken, Deborah, is there anything you guys want to add that, that we haven't talked about before we switch it over to Michael? Um, I think we've, we've talked about quite a few of the issues over here. And I think that the best thing we can do, and I think the best thing Michael hit as well, is do not get into this emotionally. This is a business. This is um, something that, that you were selling over here to the buyer and the seller. You know, the buyer is a good match, seller is a good match, that's fine. Um, but if you don't take it emotionally and you don't go ahead and put things in writing that are going to cause you problems down the road, I think then that's it and you're fine. I think that's the, the best way to look at it. And you're not going to take a business that you couldn't sell. At least I hope you wouldn't. Because believe mm -hmm. me, I've seen some businesses by the time they come to me, I'm like, how do they even find a buyer for this? Because it's not even just air, it's beyond, it, it's, you know, it's polluted air. So yeah, I, I think if you're a little more, if you're pickier in the sense of what you take in, okay, and realize that it could be a potential issue, step away from it, that's your best call. And you're probably, you're going you're gonna to sell, you know, I, I'm a big believer that you, you list quality, not quantity. I mean, that's just my, my viewpoint. So that, that covers that thing. Ken, anything you want to add to anything? Yeah, I, I would kind of follow along with what Deborah's saying. I, I think that it's really important to look at the personalities and how well the parties are cooperating after, you know, if you do sign them up and, and this seems like a good deal, good seller and a good buyer, uh, or, or ones who, who make sense financially, perhaps, that as they're going through the process, if they're getting along good, you probably have very little to, to worry about after the deal closes. If they have issues, seller isn't really producing enough information. Seller isn't being upfront with how the business has been operated or how that it's transition operating. made properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my favorite one is they found three things in the computer afterwards that show they really weren't doing that business. <laughs> so yeah, the, you know, is the, is the seller coming forward and what they're doing is the buyer working well with the seller. And if they're not, even though you want that deal to close, you want your commission, you need to think about whether it makes sense for this deal to close. Because the ones where they're fighting before it closes are the ones that you have problems afterwards. And we see it again and again and again. And you're absolutely right. And the ones that are the scariest are the buyers that know nothing about the business they're buying. No, they yeah, yeah. Never, never even thought about what it was like and afterwards hate it. And it didn't matter what you sold at that point in time, didn't matter what you did, they're going to sue everybody because they're never going to be accountable for the fact that they bought a business that they had no idea what they were doing. A business with environmental liability or something. We see a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Michael, I want to switch this over to you. Um, and and I'm, when I switch over to this, I have some questions for you in regards to, you know, insurance and some of the other insurances that you offer. But these are the two things that I hear a lot from business brokers. You can't get e and insurance for business brokers, which we know is not true because I've got, you know, insurance from you. And the other one is, is, uh, you know, they'll say, well, if you do get, you know, insurance and you can find it, you're more likely to get sued because now there's deep pockets that can get, you know, that they can go after and they know that you've got an insurance company and they can sue. What's your response to that? Both are completely not true at all. First, you know, the lawyers that are going after you, 
have no knowledge that you have insurance policy in place. So the reality is, is you're either going to defend yourself and uh, reply to their uh, demands yourself, or you're going to hire an attorney. They don't know you. There's no way to look up whether a business broker has an ENO policy, first of all. Second of all, ENO insurance, there's 10 to 20 different insurance carriers that write it for business brokers. So um, the problem is, is unless you're dealing with a niche person, they probably are not interested because the premium levels are so small, you know, so it's not like a big thing for them. You know, you need to deal with someone that that writes this stuff on a day to day basis. And Ken, Deborah, you guys got some kind of ENO insurance, right, for your own practice? Oh, sure. We have uh, malpractice insurance. Yep. Okay. So Absolutely. the attorneys have it. So I think we should too. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Attorneys, and CPA, doctors, lawyers, architects, dentists, yeah. engineers. I, I think that's a really bad excuse to say, well, I'm going to get sued more if I had the, you know, insurance. That's, you, you might as well say, well, I'm not going to carry homeowners insurance or health insurance or um, auto, sorry, liability. Auto, <laughs> auto liability insurance, or I'm not going to, you know, because I, I don't want to, you know, it's, it's, I, I think you're just being cheap to not pay right. for the insurance. Nobody, no offense, Michael, but nobody wants to pay for insurance. It's not like you can look at it and go take a drive for it down the road. You know, it's yeah. something that doesn't, it's not tangible. Nobody wants yeah. to pay for it, but you need to pay for it. Yeah, you need to pay for it, but first it's your business, right? And you, you, every business broker, I'm sure, takes their business very seriously, right? Just like I do, and many of them are independent contractors. So, you know, which is an issue too. If, you, if your firm is not purchasing the E&O, how are you protected as an independent contractor, which is a whole nother issue. Yeah. I mean, I would tell you, to be honest with you, I, I, I only started carrying E&O insurance a couple of years ago because I didn't know that you could even get E&O insurance as a business broker up until a few years ago. And that's when I started getting it through you guys, Michael, and I've been very happy. And um, this isn't an ad for Michael. I don't have him on for any reason. I'm not getting any <laughs> special deal or anything. It's, it's just I think every business broker out there should be carrying E&O insurance. So let's say that a business broker does get sued. You know, you guys, the insurance company is going to pick up the, the cost of the legal battle. I mean, if it's a $50,000 bill for over a two-year period of time, even if you didn't do anything wrong, you can still get sued. For and anything. if it costs $50,000 to, to defend, the insurance company is paying for that, right? That's correct. Uh, the insurance company is paying for full defense costs in the final judgment um, minus the deductible on the, on the policy. And in, in many cases in different states, punitive damages and, and class action lawsuits as well. And, uh, you know, they, they also uh, include libel and slander in a lot of these policies as well. But, yeah, it's full. It's really your defense cost coverage. That's what e is all about. It's your malpractice coverage. It's when you unintentionally screw up. Maybe you tell the buyer, oh, if you buy this business, it's sales they're going to go up 20% in this market because of X, Y, Z, right? Because you're all emotional about the deal. And that's the type of thing that comes back and back bites you in the butt on contractors. It's about their backlog. Is the backlog going to be there when you buy the electrician or the HVAC? And what happens when it goes away? What happens when the backlog, which was a bunch of BS? Uh, we see well, a lot of lawsuits over backlog on contractors. I, 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 I know a broker here in Florida, very, very good broker, very well, res much, very, very respected in Florida as a business broker, very good business broker. He got sued and it cost him a couple years of his life and, and he spent something like $50,000 and he didn't do anything wrong. He ended up winning the case, but. 50000 later. Yeah, he could have 50, spent probably $1,500 for the policy. Right. Yeah. No, it so, makes a lot of sense to have the policy. So what's, what's, what's included and what's not included in, a, in an E&O insurance policy? Well, this is, this is important. Um, yeah, so what's, what's included in, in a vanilla E&O policy is, is malpractice coverage or an error or an admission specific to the definition of what your professional services are. If you remember in the beginning, I said, what is key to these policies? What is key is listing out, if you give financial guidance on financial statements, you better let me know. If you have a real estate license, you better let me know. If you consult in other ways, 
you better let me know because otherwise the policy is going to go and be underwritten just based on business brokering and 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 oftentimes you guys get into a lot of different arenas so that that's one key thing that's the 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 definition of of who you are and what you do is how your coverage will react but these policies also can include a bunch of other coverages such as uh, general liability, which is if you cause bodily injury or property damage to someone else, employment pra practices liability, which if, there's, if you have employees, there's wrongful termination, sexual harassment, or even discrimination against a customer. Uh, there's cyber, cyber's a big issue. And some of them bundle in high, what's called hired and not known coverage. So let's say you have a bunch of independent contractors under you. Let's say you're ABC LLC and you have all these independent business brokers under you and they're out there driving their own cars on your behalf with yeah. low liability limits and they hit and kill my family. Well, guess who's getting sued in that situation? Not only are they personally, not only is their potential entity getting sued, but so is your ABC LLC who they were operating on behalf of. So there's there's a lot of different covers. They were going to a meeting at the time. Absolutely. They're going to a meeting at the time in their own personal car. They're an agent of yours. They hit another hit a, hit a family. Unfortunately, they kill the family and they're suing that agent and they're suing your company. Absolutely. And that that's one that's often overlooked because you know also the business brokers that how they title their vehicles is very important and how the coverage reacts to all that as well. Yeah, and that doesn't cost that much. I added that to my policy. What is that called? Hired and non-owned liability coverage. Okay, you're gonna have to say that again. Hired and non-owned liability. Just call Michael and tell him you need the auto insurance thing along with the you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and get an umbrella, right, Michael? <laughs> Real well, quick. you know what's interesting is if you ask most CPAs and even attorneys, um, they'll they'll say the most important insurance coverage is actually the personal umbrella to yeah. sit over all your personal mm -hmm. assets. Right. Um, yeah, right. I was gonna throw in um just in support of, of calling Mike, that I, I think that people, you know, brokers need to realize, uh, and I see a lot of the, on the Q and A, that individuals can absolutely be sued, whether you have liability or not, as an agent versus the broker. Uh, it depends on the situation, and you want to make sure that you've got coverage. Uh, I can tell you from from the attorney standpoint, if we're going to sue somebody on a deal, we're suing everybody whose name's involved, everybody. and and we'll figure out later if there's actual liability or not, because oftentimes we just want to grab every insurance company out there and, and right. get them involved. So Mike you're, you're mean. Yes, I, I think that's important. You're mean, Ken. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. That's, I, I'm I, not I the one doing it. I know that's your job. I know. That's not what you do. I'm just, I'm just being silly. So what's, what's um, this, 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 this hammer clause, Michael? Yeah. So in every, you know, policy, there's what's called a hammer clause or some will say there's a settlement clause. So when there's a lawsuit, the lawyer or attorney could come to you and say, hey, look, we can settle. The insurance company will say, hey, we could settle this for $50,000 right now because statistically, if we keep fighting, we might lose half a million, right? Mm -hmm. So they go to you and, and you say, no, I don't want to settle. So you're delaying their settlement, right? You're not, you're not going, you're withholding their consent to settle. And so whenever you do that in, in all these e and insurance policies, there's a percentage in there that if you go that route, you're going to be on the hook. So you could have a 50-50 clause where if you do not agree to their, their settlement, then you could end up paying 50% of all the costs of not only the settlement, but the defense in, in the case. That's a killer it is. And so you've got to know what your hammer clause is and they all have one. Okay. So you, you need to really understand what that clause is and how it works because sometimes there might be a situation where you don't want to settle and you're adamant about it. Mm -hmm. And I can understand why the, the insurance company needs to have that in there though. Cause you know, it's all their money. If not, you know, if you're not giving consent, it's their money that's at risk. They're the ones that are going to pay the $150,000 out of their pocket to settle, you know, minus your deductible. And, you know, 
one of the faults. You, you're not consenting and it costs them a half a million dollars. You know, you don't get burned at all. You, you know, it, you know, I can understand why they have that in there. Yeah. If they're they going got, up, they got the, the risk. If they evaluate the risk, they decide. Yeah. Hey, Michael, could you tell us really quickly one or two real world uh, examples of claims, claims um, that you've seen submitted for business brokers? Yeah. Um, like I, I have a couple right here, but I'll just use ABC company. Maybe um, like 60 it, seconds per one yep, or something. Okay. Uh, ABC company were buyers. They uh, performed their due diligence for a business and everything was in order. Uh, after purchasing, um, ABC wanted the business to run on its own and uh, the business eventually failed. Uh, the, the, the folks sued the seller and named all the franchises, the case settled for $75,000. That's a real life scenario with a business broker that you would know. Now, you notice- 75, my, 75 grand that, that, was, that was the responsibility of the business broker that you guys correct. picked up the tab yeah, for. Correct. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, now, you notice these are like extremely detailed because it's hard to be somewhat detailed <laughs> yeah. because it's personal, right? But I'm reading right. real life Here's one uh, contractor purchased a business from another construction company. Um, the one the contractor sued the other construction company, claiming he overpaid for the business because it was overstated. Um, they were the business broker was named in the lawsuit, uh, and the case eventually settled for two hundred fifty thousand. Wow. Wow. And that's 250 that the broker didn't have to pay. Yeah. All right. Hey, you guys, it, we're, we're at three 30 right now. Can we, can you guys got 10 more minutes? If you don't, you can jump off. Do you guys okay with 10 more minutes? Sure. sure. Okay. Let's open it up to, 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 to our callers out there. If anybody has a question for, you know, Michael from AOR insurance or Ken or Deborah, just raise your virtual hand. Um, somebody in the chat box, please tell people how to raise their virtual hand so they know how to do that because I still don't know how to do that. So I'm going to leave it out to you guys to, to mention the chat box. And when I um, pick you up in the virtual hand, keep the questions to like 20, 30 seconds. Tell me where you're from and what your name is. And I'm going, you're going to have to unmute yourself. I'm going to bring Scott Levine in, Levine in first. Scott, are you there? Yeah, I had to wait for the box to come up to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Where are you calling from, Scott? Boca Raton. I'm with Amerivest Group. Excellent. Welcome I'm, to have you, Scott. Thank you very much. And I appreciate you all doing this for us. Uh, I just, I'm curious about the duty to, to disclose. I'm going to try to be very brief. Uh, I was involved in a transaction where there's a buyer, seller, they're each represented by attorneys. We had a meeting between the buyer and the seller. The potential buyer asked the seller, are there any lawsuits against you? And the seller said, no. That night I get a call from the seller, Scott, there is a lawsuit against us. Well, then why'd you tell them there wasn't? because the attorney who's handling the lawsuit said that we're in negotiations and I am not to disclose this to anyone. So there I am stuck in the middle knowing that material things should be disclosed. So I called the seller's other attorney who was actually handling the negotiation of the sale and I said, what do we do here? Don't we have to disclose? So that attorney said, yeah, it should be disclosed, but let me talk to the other attorney first. Bottom line, there wasn't a meeting of the minds between the buyer and the seller. It was, all, it was a negotiation going on. No monies had been transferred, and we ended up dragging our feet, and it was settled prior to us getting to any type of an asset purchase agreement or a deposit. What's your opinion on all that, this duty to disclose where the broker is kind of stuck in the middle? You, you said both buyer and seller had counsel? Yes. Okay, it's buyer's duty, it's buyer's counsel's duty to do a search. Okay, but I, I'm, I'm talking about the liability of the agent or the broker because what, you know, you, you know, way back when, when I took my real estate yeah. license, you know, they emphasize that in a real estate transaction, certainly material facts needed to be disclosed. This is a commercial transaction. It's a sale of a business. Uh, so, you know, 
I, I basically left it up to the attorneys to figure it all out. Yes, and I made sure I, I documented I that, that. But yeah, what I, was I, my duty in all this? I think you're in the best situation when you've got attorneys on both sides and you did, did the right thing. The real problem comes when you don't have attorneys on one or the other or both sides. And I think uh, your idea of going back to the seller and the seller's litigation counsel is the best way to go about it, try to get more information, try to understand, is it a lawsuit that has actually been filed or one that's been threatened? Because if it's filed, then it's public knowledge, it's public uh, information that it's out there and the seller's attorney shouldn't be telling, you know, can't tell you not to disclose it. Um, you may want to delay shortly if they're in the middle of a very brief type of settlement effort uh, and they tell you that. But generally speaking, I think you do have a duty to disclose that if you know about it. And I think you're covered if it's a filed lawsuit. If it is a threatened lawsuit, then I think your potential liability is lessened because it isn't an actual lawsuit, it's a potential. Uh, but I still think you need to investigate it and find out the detail. And it may come to a situation where you really do need to let buyer know because you don't want them to get blindsided by it. And I think actually too, if you have the seller investigate it, that's not a bad thing either. What I, yeah, I see what you're saying, Kim, but what I do is I tell the seller to go back then and have that litigation attorney provide more information. Right. And, that, and that's a, a big difference. So you don't, as a broker, don't necessarily have to get involved in that aspect of it. And I agree, unless it's a settlement and the terms of the settlement are which are confidential, the settlement itself may not be confidential at all because it is a filed lawsuit. It did come to conclusion. And I Thank agree, you. we could do an affidavit to protect the buyer from coming on over there. Plus I've done even with the SBA deals and we find out that there's a lawsuit and we can do something either holding escrow or we can get the, the opinion if everyone feels comfortable and that's it, it's done. And there's an affidavit and you're done. But, uh, but I agree for, for a broker, it's a really, it's a, hard, it's a hard thing to think about what do I disclose and what do I don't disclose because you are a transactional agent for the most part. Thank you, Scott, so much for that, that, that question. We got, uh, we got seven more minutes. Barbara, can you unmute yourself? Can you hear us? I can hear you, can you hear me? I sure can, thank you for joining us. That doesn't Where sound like a yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, we, yeah, we oh, can yeah. hear you. Okay. So, okay. Where are you calling yeah. from, Barbara? I'm Barbara Klein. I'm calling from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm a business broker and affiliated with a real estate company called Absolute Investment Realty. And um, there, when you were talking about NDAs, it kind of brought a question to mind. The question is, you have somebody sign an NDA, then there's kind of a high level, which is a little bit more information that's in the marketing material, but something that just sees whether they're interested or not. My strategy has always been that if at, at that point, unless I am aware that this is a deep competitor, I will just share the high level information. Uh, if I know it's a competitor, I'm going to check first. Uh, if it gets into more detail, I tell my seller who it is that I'm working with and I wanted to make sure that that was a good strategy based on your discussion of NDAs and I've also got one quick question which is E&O insurance the same as business liability insurance because that's what my agent is telling me. You want to go first Michael? No. Then we'll go. Michael did you hear did you hear our question? She wanted to know if liability I just, I just liability just the last part. She wanted to know if liability insurance and E&O insurance were the same thing. No, uh, liability and E&O insurance are not the same thing. Liability protects you against bodily injury or property damage to a third party. That means if you hurt someone, injure someone, cause property damage to them, someone else, your E&O insurance covers you for your negligence in making a mistake, unintended mistake, a non-intentional mistake of guiding or consulting someone uh, through a business buying transaction or a real estate transaction or any type of professional services that you might provide. Excellent. And the answer Thank to you, the NDA, uh, I might say over there that the seller, you might recommend to the seller that they have their attorney draft a different NDA, particularly if it is going to be a higher level and, and they protect them, uh, themselves from any other liabilities. And I think that for you to do that is not something you know that you want to do. Your NDA mostly is to protect your commission in reality. I mean, it's, a, it's loosely written in a sense to protect some part of the deal, 
but it's really not going to protect the seller 100% on an NDA. The NDAs that brokers put out over there are really more commission-based so that nobody goes behind your back. And that's how I look at it anyway. So if you need something that really needs to be fleshed out, because this is a niche business, this is a business that you know when you give out details on that, that uh, either someone can go ahead and uh, that's a competitor is going to have an issue with, you want to have the seller's attorney write that out very, very, very carefully. Guys, we've got like five or six people raising their hands right now. We're, we're going to have to close this off in about four minutes, just let everybody know. Let's bring Arthur. Arthur, can you hear us? Do you want to unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Okay. Can yes. you hear me? Arthur, hey, okay. how you doing? Where are you calling from? Uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. All right. Thank you for uh -huh. joining us. Yes. Um, I have a question. I'm new to this, and I'm going to sell cost brokerage. If your broker, I'm an agent, is covered on, I'm not, I have to ask him the question with that insurance policy, are you covered as a blanket, or could they sue you individually? So you're working under a firm, and you're asking if they have the N.O. if it transitions to you, correct? Correct. Yes. Um, almost all policies, not all, but most, transition the definition of the named insured that means the person insured they include independent contractors in that uh, named insured definition which name means you would be covered under their policy however it's always good to get it in writing right <laughs> we talk about writing <laughs> i would get it in writing vanel do you have a question are you with us Yes, I'm here. Thanks, uh, James, and appreciate Where all Where are you calling from? Today. Calling from Long Beach, California. All right. Welcome. Thank What's you. your question? Uh, yeah, so my question is, you know, our purchase agreements here through CAB basically state that the buyer and seller will look to each other and identify and hold the broker harmless from the claims. Is language like that more of a, something to make us feel good, or does that really hold some water when it comes to... It makes you feel good. Us? Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to take one more. We've got two more minutes. We'll take one more. And Lee, are you, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Sure can. Where are you calling from, Lee? I'm calling from Tyler, Texas. Oh, welcome. Right. <laughs> What's your question? Uh, question is, so we use a confidentiality agreement. It's kind of fashioned as a buyer's confidentiality and warranty agreement. And in that, it kind of has some verbiage that says that they warranty that they will hold us harmless in the event of a lawsuit or anything like that. Is all of that garbage or is that, is there any merit to that? I'll, I'll try to take a stab at that. I mean, it's hard to say a Texas law versus Florida law where, where I'm licensed to practice. So I can't say too much about Texas. I can say generally um, it depends on the circumstances. If the buyer is relying on you and it's, uh, you know, you put yourself out there in a way that's a little bit too much, then it could cause a problem. If buyer causes you a problem uh, and there's a warranty from buyer in that agreement, that probably would be upheld. But I, again, it really depends on the circumstances of what, what was happening. If I can't, what I think too is that, remember, you're holding yourself out as a professional. So I think that makes a huge difference too that can, in uh, saying a lay person and anything in that regard. So when you hold yourself out in that regard, then I think that it doesn't have as much weight when you even put that uh, hold harmless identification in there. All right, excellent. Hey, that, I think that pretty much wraps us up for, for the day. I think we could have kept taking questions, but uh, we've already went past our time. Deborah, Michael, Ken, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for joining us. That was a, I think we did a whirlwind of information so quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Hi, Jim. Thank, thank you. you. Thank appreciate you, it. Thank Enjoy you, Michael. It. Bye now. Hey, thank so you. everybody out there, I just want to let you know, thank you for joining us today. If you are watching on this, watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel. Really would appreciate it. You'd be more likely to see our videos in the future. If you are watching this live and you've never watched our videos on YouTube, please go to YouTube. Google Jim Parker Business Broker. It'll pull up. We've got some great videos on there. Make sure you subscribe. Really would appreciate it. Until next time, work hard, work smart, and keep making those buyer-seller connections. Thank you.